Howdy. Welcome to Undersampled Radio, the show where we talk science, tech, oil, business, politics, and more. Hi, I'm Matt. And I'm Graham. Together, we're the hosts of this circus. To follow the conversation, make suggestions, or rant and rave, please visit the forum Software Underground at swung.rocks. All right, I'm afraid. <laughs> I, we used to have a thing, especially when we were broadcasting live, where I would like to surprise Matt by going live, trying to get him to say something compromising and pressing the record button. <laughs> Usually unsuccessful, but every now and then we got a gem. Yeah, well, I was just generalizing about Newfoundlanders, so hopefully you didn't catch that. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, dearies. Welcome to Undersampled Radio, episode 92. We have the Collision of Worlds episode today. <laughs> this is a bit surreal for me, having old world Matt Halls and new world Lynn Posix here with us. Um, old world relative to Graham? Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm not going to try to read too much into that remark, okay. but yeah, sure. <laughs> I accept it. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, we have one news bullet point today, which is Data Science Salon will be in Austin next week. And I'll be there. What is that? It's a data science conference. Oh, it's a, it's a, it's a conference. Well, so, um, I don't know why they call it a salon. Yeah, yeah, that's an unusual, that makes it sound like, I'm not sure. <laughs> that makes it, it, makes it sound like an afternoon. Maybe there's tea, um, light entertainment, jazz piano. <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> sort of people would retreat to salons to have discussions. Right. That's true. And conversation. And so I think the idea is it's more of a conversation than just presenting that. Is it actually, though? Because you went last year. and I. It was there. both. Uh, to their credit, okay. uh, they had more um, interactive discussion and panel discussions oh, that cool. were very interactive with the audience. Like you didn't, the panel discussions, you didn't have to wait to the end to ask questions, that kind of a thing. And then they had some presentations, too. It was good. Cool. Had a high quality speaker. Okay. So how, who puts that on and how long is it? Uh, there are, I believe there are four of them around the country, data science there's, salon. There's one in Miami. There's one in Miami. And there's one in Boston as well, I believe. I'm just looking this up on the web as we speak. Um, um, and who are these jokers with the tea and the, the jazz piano and the interactive <laughs> conversations? Um, I don't know. But they seem to know their things that the um, the talks are are quite interesting. Like they kind of bridge the gap between wild harebrained theory and uh, boring implementation, which is cool. Yeah. So there's an Austin, a New York, a San Francisco, Miami, Seattle, LA. I enjoyed a variety of speakers. So they had both technical depth on the data science side, but then they had people coming at it more from the business side as well kind of equally balanced, which is cool. Lynn was on a panel last year. Nice. And it's just a day, is it? Or it's a few days? Uh, the one in Austin is two days. It's it's Tuesday and Wednesday of next week. And there's a, I guess it's Tuesday night. There's some sort of party or reception or something like that, where I imagine there actually will be jazz piano. <laughs> there better be. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's cool. Yeah. Well, really? I don't have much news. Um, well, I maybe should just mention we're doing a hackathon at a geothermal conference this year. So I'm quite excited about that because uh, the World Ge Geothermal Congress only happens every five years. <laughs> so oh. it's like if you, if you miss it, it's, you know, and the last one, uh, I think the last one was in the Far East. And so we, uh, we didn't go, or well, maybe it was Australia. Anyway, it was a long way away. And uh, this year it's in Iceland which is in principle not too far away, although it's a couple of flights uh, for me. I think most places in Europe you can get there in one hop. And um, uh, yeah, so I'm kind of excited. It's the biggest geothermal event you know, there is. So there's geoscience, engineering, economics, business of geothermal energy and all the rest of it. And um, we thought we'd try showing up there and doing one of our one of our hackathons subsurface stuff it'll be the weekend after 
the event. So it's going to be our, our event on the 2nd and 3rd of May. Um, the, the Congress is the five days leading up to that, so the last week in, in April. So that's in Reykjavik. I'm pretty, pretty interested in seeing how that goes. Like, we may have left it a little late because I've been inviting people in the last couple of weeks and I've had a lot of, um, oh yeah, I'm flying back that day kind of responses. I'm like, mm. oh, okay, <laughs> damn. Um, so it might, it might just be me and Rob and Diego. What are the, is there a theme or do you guys have like a, a, a group of interested people? You know, do you know what, the, what you're going to focus on? Yeah, I, to be honest, like we've done a bit of work in geothermal, but not tons. And so I found it hard to sort of narrow in on something that I knew would be of universal appeal. So I went for the old uh, machine learning subsurface sort of uh, safety valve and um you know i think we're, we'll be at the conference as well in the sort of mode of gathering ideas hopefully even data tools problems and looking around for things that we can hack on at the end of the week um yeah so it, you know that was one of the things i had a bit of trouble sort of settling on was you know what to go for for a theme because for all i know the nerds in the geothermal sort of business are all in I don't know finance or power generation power transmission or something like that so uh, I'm sort of trying to not to have too many preconceptions about who's gonna show up <laughs> we'll see it, anyway I feel somewhat out of my depth but that's you know that was that's was deliberate it's a while since we did anything on the edge you know, it Sounds hot, yeah. I don't know. I just only this is the best one I could come up with. I'm just, <laughs> I can see you thinking while I was talking. Like, it's got to be a pun. Uh, yeah, it should be. Cool. Um, a trip to, to Iceland sounds wonderful. <laughs> I right. I know. Blue lagoons and everything, and uh, yeah, we'll be cut in a customarily sweet looking venue we found and uh, there's it's got a cafe attached to it so my expectations for the food are high won't be, won't be tacos i don't think but it'd be something equivalently delicious involving shark <laughs> shark taco <laughs> yeah it does sound good um so i suppose we should introduce our guest who as i've mentioned is lynn posick she is the co-founder of expiro and is, as it relates to this episode, uh, both a UX and product expert, has been doing that stuff for many years, um, is a writer, which we'll get to later, speaker, we'll also get to that later, mentor, strategist, friend. Happy to have you on the show. Thank you, happy to be here. You're welcome. I don't know how this hasn't happened sooner, actually. Um, I don't know, I think you've asked a couple of times. And it just hasn't. I'm busy. Yeah. I think yeah. Timing has been a little off. So yeah. yeah. So we have um, we have a pretty technical audience, I think, on on average, um, in terms of the I think the the primary segments that we have as as an audience are geo scientists and data scientists, um, and so I know that at least some of those people. Uh, won't even know what the hell UX is. So can we start there? Sure, yeah. And uh, you know, if you ask 10 different people, they'll tell you 10 different things of what they think user experience is. And believe it or not, this is like a, a hotly debated topic when you just <laughs> do the X versus the I, so UI versus UX in, in the field. Um, but uh, the way that I like to think about it is uh, you know, the user experience is not, whether it's a piece of software or, or physical product or whatever, it's not just, you know, the colors or the style of stuff. And that's sort of the visceral reaction people have. Oh, it's your UI is this color, or your mug is you know, whatever. Um, user experience is really, it's just, it's a vehicle, it's an aspect for delivering value to the user, right? And it's gotta look great. It's gotta be easy to use if you're talking about software or you know, some physical product. But it's really about the value, what value do you derive, right? And how is that value delivered to me, right? If it's software, it's delivered through this experience. It's like bits and clicks, and it's got to look nice and easy to use. Um, 
if it's a physical item, you know, maybe it has a nice grip or it turns a certain way, or, you know, kind of a thing. Are there, is there like a um, textbook classic example of turning something that had horrible UX into something that has great UX? Oh gosh. Um, yeah, I mean, there's, there's a lot of them. Um, so I, I mean, you know, sort of the, the uh, canonical example would be um, people that take, uh, you know, something that is uh, maybe old or mission critical and you, you know, you hear these stats and these stories about some mission critical system and that, you know, um, uh, was so hard to use that it was really impacting people's lives in a negative way or, or causing harm to people and then the user experience is made easier to use and so now it's it's better. Um, user experience or human factors all the way. Diving really deep here, a little, a little um, deeper in the stratigraphy. I'll throw that out there. No! I'm deep in the stratigraphy. Um, it has its roots in aviation uh, and avionics in World War I. So nobody really thought much about having conventions or repeatable patterns or how to organize information and display it to a user in the cockpit. Um, and pilots were making poor decisions just when they had to change equipment or even within the same line of equipment or type of aircraft, the avionics were haphazardly placed. And so in one aircraft, they might look down to the right and see, you know, the altimeter and then in another aircraft, maybe it's in the top left and, you know, in the heat of battle, they're looking at the, the wildly thing. diving. Exactly. Right. Had a lot of problems. And so that was uh, kind of the, um, the inception of human factors in the physical realm. And then human factors eventually uh, informed uh, software development as well. And then went on to be human computer interaction and UI and now today UX. Yeah, I mean, even the um, these Boeing 737 MAX issues seem to have some relationship with usability because pilots could be, you know, it was a avoidable accident um, it's, it was all about sort of pilot response and how the system sort of reacted to, or didn't react, I guess, to pilots' attempts yeah. at input. <laughs> yeah, so not to jump yeah. too far ahead in our, our later discussion, but, but human on the loop, right, or in the loop. On, uh, right. So what, what is your background? Like, how did you get into uh, UX and are you, are, do you have a design background or is it a technology background? Uh, so I actually started off in molecular biology and decided that that was not um, for me. I did not really, I didn't, I didn't fit in in kind of the lab. Um, I'm glad that people like to do that work. <laughs> that was not for me. Um, but I also got to do software at the same time that I was doing that biology work. Mm. And I really enjoyed the software aspects that I kept gravitating towards spending more time um, designing and helping to build some of the software for the experiments. I was like, maybe I should just go do that because <laughs> I enjoy that more than the actual biology itself. Although I love it still in biology, but more like in a scientific American at my nightstand sort of way. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, so yeah, so I kind of had this haphazard, as many people do that are like me. I've you know been in the field over 20 years. People that kind of are of that generation. Um, like we have some folks on staff here that are anthropologists. Um, you know, we had an archeologist, we have architects. Um, so some people, you know, more recent generations have these shiny kind of UI degrees. <laughs> but a lot of us kind of found our way into the field sort of haphazardly. Huh, interesting. And um, I, like if I remember rightly, Xpero, were, you, you were the founder of Xpero and um, it, the company merged with Palladium Consulting, which was more of a technology uh, or sort of, uh, what do you call it? I guess coding, com programming company. Uh, is, that, is that right? Do I have that straight? Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. So what, um, when did you start Xpero? 2003. Okay, right. And, it, and the focus there was on, on, on uh, user interaction, user in, um, experience, design was it or did you also do technology development and uh, you know uh, software uh, engineering? so uh, in software vernacular we also did um the presentation layer or the front end as well <coughs> excuse me um a little bit um 
but uh, we partnered really closely with Palladium on many projects, uh, especially where the heavy lifting kind of was required. But yeah, we were front end focused and product as well. So product strategy, visioning, um, product market fit, that kind of stuff. Yeah, I see. Okay, so the, the relationship with Palladium went back a little, a little ways. Mm -hmm. You were already collaborating on projects. Yeah, yeah, actually it goes way back. Sebastian and I were colleagues at a company 20 years ago. Um, that was how we originally met. Right, right, awesome. Yeah, and um, it sounds like, um, you know, the companies continue to grow and get into all sorts of new things. Um, like how, um, if it, like, I think my, my UX came into my sort of, <laughs> uh, peripheral vision at least when when we started playing around with um, mobile apps and it seemed like mo mobile seemed to somehow underscore really emphasize to almost everybody because the design of mobile stuff was so different from what people were used to on desktops that it seemed like there was a kind of because maybe just to frame that I don't know if that's an observation or just a, an accident of when I happened to start paying attention to it but I, I was really interested in typography and design as a sort of younger person. I, for some reason, I was obsessed with typography as a, as a sort of even teenager, which sounds really nerdy and lame, but there you go. Um, when the internet came along, design just seemed to basically evaporate almost over. Like we spent all this time figuring out how to get really good at print media and designing beautiful books and posters and things. My wife's a publisher in, in books. So, you know, we paid a lot of attention to stuff like that. And then the internet came along you know, so sort of, uh, what, like late 90s, I guess, when, you know, companies were sort of first got their hands on a domain. The internet sites just looked like garbage. I mean, it was yeah. horrendous. It, it, it just went backwards of decades, the whole concept of design. Um, sorry, I did not think this. <laughs> if this is, a, I don't know if this is a question or what, I didn't think it through clearly. Right. But, no, um, right. It felt to me like mobile was when, people woke up again and started being like, oh, actually things can look amazing and be highly functional and valuable. Yeah, I, I think, <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I, I've, <laughs> um, uh, I, I observed similar things where there was this time where we were creating really ugly electronic paper. Um, <laughs> yeah. And it, I, I think some of it had to do with, you know, uh, uh, lim just limitations of the technology and skill set, right. right? And so, mm -hmm. It didn't, the knowledge and the skill set of people that could create really easy to use and good looking things on paper or even in um, other interactive mediums didn't translate right away to HTML and just the core technologies, right? So there's this right. gap where you have people creating things without really a lot of design um, focus or forethought. It's like you had an experience de facto because you coded it and, and there you go, you've got something out there. But it's, it really wasn't necessarily a, a thing uh, to, to think through kind of foundationally before you then you know, kind of put it out there. But, and mobile did have a big impact. And the, the other thing that's had a tremendous impact is this notion of design systems. Um, and some of that came about with the mobile first movement, but even um, before that, um, before we have these stronger, uh, you know, HTML frameworks, whatever, um, you know, Google played a big role in this and now Airbnb has it, like Facebook has theirs, right? Um, but this notion of, okay, there could be this group of components um, that work together and you could like Lego bricks kind of put them together in a semi-sensible way. You still need people to be thinking about it, whether you're a developer, designer, or whatever, it doesn't matter. Um, but it, it's sort of like, uh, you know, the Lego effect where like you, it, you can screw things up, but there's still at least some baseline there. <laughs> Professionalism and how bad it can be, you know. Um, it's, it's, uh, much less risky than before we had these design systems where people were really rolling all their own stuff and spending effort doing that. It's way inconsistent off the reservation. What's a design system? <laughs> is it, I mean, is it literally a group of components that y you can use as technological building blocks? Is it like a library of design? Yeah, that's a good way to think about it. So, and depending on the level of maturity of the system, it could be a system that 
doesn't have any code behind it, where the components are more for people designing things without code, and they want to just like lay things out in a prototype or whatever. Um, a, a more mature design system for each component will actually have code behind it. So like, let's say you wanted to put together a dashboard or something, right? You might have um, all of those individual components in a library, and the library has maybe some rules around it that advises people on how to use those components, like in our world, a histogram is best for these kinds of things for a portfolio of, you know, some sort of financial instrument or whatever. You can get very specific with it if you're using a design system in a certain context. So, um, like Google and Airbnb, so like Google has material, which is a design system. It's both, people conflate that one because they have their material theme, which you can kind of, which is the style and the look and feel and a little bit of behavior, which you can apply to almost anything or emulate. Um, but then they have all of these components as well that should be kind of, you know, kept uh, in a library and working together. That's just one of them. Airbnb has one, Facebook has one. Ant is another one that deals more with like kanji and Mandarin. Is, is that, is the idea of a, a design system relate, I sometimes hear people talk about a grammar, like a, a grammar of graphics or grammar of design. Is, is that a related sort of, sort of concept? Uh, I can see that. I, I, um, I'll, actually, I'm going to borrow that term. I like that term of like the, the grammar or the grammatical structure. Um, we, do, we do talk about it as a, me, a mechanism for communication because now um, cross-discipline, product development, design, you can go to a library and point in a component and say, I think we're going to use this here, <laughs> you know, in this workflow, in this screen, and maybe we're going to change it up just a little bit, but very quickly. Everybody knows what we're talking about. Hopefully, we're reusing a lot of that same code that's already been QA'd, and you know, and, um, so we're not we're decreasing the burden on development. We're also decreasing the burden on designers because now they've got a baseline. So yeah, I mean, we it's definitely very much a language of communication. Yeah, that's cool. I mean, I like that concept because that implies or recognizes that there's a um, that things have a sort of semantic meaning. So, so, you know, and maybe that requires a level of literacy in your users, and maybe it took decades of consistent design among, I don't know, the technology community to sort of establish that, and obviously all the work by companies like Apple and um, so on and all the thought they put into it. But it does seem like, you know, you, in general, there are some pieces around that if you show them to people, they immediately sort of understand what they can do with it or what. I mean, yeah. people used to joke about babies trying to pinch photos after they'd used iPads and things. But I've noticed like, myself doing that recently. And so there's a fairly new thing actually that my brain took obviously an extra decade to get that wiring. But it's quite, it's quite a weird feeling to misapply or misread a technology and the grammar that's available to you, the interaction sort yeah. of uh, modalities that are available. Um, Again, I don't know where I'm going with that. No, <laughs> no, yeah, so for we'll sure. And, 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 and um, I guess to just play forward a little bit. So uh, in the world that we all live in, and I'm sure a lot of your audience members, things are very complex. So, you know, I was speaking earlier about Google material. Well, they're going to hate me if they go look at Google material and they'll go, this is too simple for us. We can't even use this design system this person was talking about. Um, and so like, that's one of the things that we run into at Xperia a lot and in other companies too that do anything of complexity is a lot of these design systems top out. So they top out in terms of components um, that both will literally break when you try to load the data sets into them, but just even in terms of design and navigability, they just don't scale. It could be simple things like um, you know, even in a data grid, being able to support, uh, you know, sophisticated filtering mechanisms, like a lot of those have that. But certainly when you start talking about data visualizations, like a lot of the work we do has very interconnected data, for example, mm -hmm. and supporting, if you have interconnected data or data rich um, environments, supporting exploration, a lot of the design systems um, that are kind of just readily available, pretty lousy at that. They want very finite, discrete tasks. It's, you know, I'm on my mobile and I have three steps or how do I reveal, you know, the equivalent of a contact or whatever? It doesn't need to be a contact, but you know, some analog thereof. Um, not, you know, how do I, how do I browse? Which you wouldn't do on your mobile, probably. But you know, how do I browse? Um, you know, 
10 million years of stratigraphy and, <laughs> and, and seismic data, you know, those kinds of, um, whether you're on a desktop or mobile, but I, the, we've had to invent um, uh, design systems for people's, people like seismic interpreters and processors and, and so forth, because um, the, a lot of the systems out there just aren't intended for domain experts and scale. A lot of them are aimed more at B2B. Is there a way to anticipate or quantify the complex keyword? Like, is there a, are there metrics that you look for when you're approaching a new design project to, to know a priori whether it's going to require these specialized design patterns or not? Yeah, so there, there's, um, uh, for us, there, you know, there's a couple of different indicators. Um, so, uh, you know, if, um, first, is it a B2C or B2B audience? Some B2C flows and things can still be complex. Um, the complexity is a continuum, right? Um, things tend to ratchet up when you start talking about B2B and the more, or just the more expert someone is, is the more in-depth kinds of things they want to do. Right, their technology, their product, or whatever. Um, so, uh, you know, categorically, things like exploration, like I was mentioning, where there's no clear, um, there's an there's an end goal, but there's not a clear A, a to B point to point necessarily on how to get there. Right. Mm -hmm. So, domain expert brings big open ended question to the technology, uh, but if it's software, right, and so they're looking to answer that question um, for a domain expert. Um, you know, simple might be, I spent three hours in this piece of software and that still felt great and simple to me because at the end of three hours, I could explore and find um, the answer I was looking for, you know, whatever, some outcome, mm -hmm. right? Um, if you're in the B2C world, um, three, forget three hours, you, you probably, if you're on a website, you have 30 seconds or 10 seconds to make your point and to get someone through a workflow, right? Yeah. So it, it's complexity is kind of relative. Are things becoming more complex? This, this is a question I wrote in the show notes because yeah. I, I'm interested. I, I think, so back to your point, Matt, I mean, users, even non-expert users seem to be coming more expert at using technology specifically. So it's, it feels to me like a lot of technology is progressing to become, to service more complex workflows, even if they are just an extension of the original workflow. Do you find that, Simi? Yeah, I think it's, you know, I think there's this duality to it where it's on, in some ways becoming simpler because we have things like design systems and paradigms and we know we're supposed to pinch, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. um, so uh, in some ways things are getting simpler because they're more predictable and we have more standardization. And in other ways, you know, technology, data, um, machine learning, um, those are always pushing the boundaries, right? Technology is always ever evolving. Um, sometimes that means things are getting more complex. Sometimes it's not really necessarily re related to complexity. It's just pushing in some direction. But yeah, I mean, uh, things are getting more complex. That doesn't mean, though, that the experience needs to be more complex for the user necessarily, right? So like if we're doing machine learning, what's happening in the background might be very complex, exponentially so compared to other systems, right? Mm -hmm. But the user's experience may not be, right? It might, might be delivered in a way where actually we've made their experience easier because now instead of having to spend three hours doing that data exploration, the machine learning can offer a prediction or a recommendation that results in two clicks for a user. Mm -hmm. Where previously it might have been three hours of analysis to figure that out. Yeah. So perhaps the technology is driving less complexity into it's, yeah, it's, human it's both. interfaces <laughs> or driving humans out of interfaces. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, what, what, one thing I felt, or, or I don't know, never felt like um, was well supported by technology I've used, and I'm thinking about things like seismic interpretation, um, was the sort of progression that a person has at least, and I think it's kind of similar to what we do in a, a machine learning workflow too. Um, and so maybe all these problems will go away when we're not doing interpretation anymore, <laughs> but for now, anyway, um, where your workflow moves from kind of 
uh, querying and exploration of data to more sort of hands-on interpretation and manipulation of data to communication and um, QC and sort of high level comparisons and decision making. Mm. Like, I've, like you look at something like Petrel, which I'm sure you've seen, uh, you know, it's the preeminent seismic interpretation tool uh, from Schlumberger. And I mean, essentially it's it, the tool is in principle supposed to support you through all of those workflows, but it doesn't change through those workflows. You just have to change how you use it. And, and, and for some aspects of it, like the communication bit, you essentially give in and just take a screenshot. I mean, that's what most people do. You just say, well, you know, for the communication bit, I'm just going to take screenshots, put it in PowerPoint, and I'll show that to people. Um, some things like ArcGIS are a little bit better. You can actually say, no, I'm going to use ArcGIS itself in a more of a presentation mode to show people what I've done. And that's really nice because then they can ask, questions and you can adapt and say oh I'll turn that layer on I'll turn this layer off and there's a much more um, a much richer communication tool that way um, <laughs> in keeping with my previous questions I have no question but uh, <laughs> how, how can we get better at design like the thing is you don't uh, there's no way that the, even the in, um, the programmer doesn't know what a person's going to go and do with their technology I don't know what I'm going to do with a piece of technology as an interpreter until I start doing it. So how on earth can we get ahead of that and design all of those different modalities? Like, it seems like it can never end. Like you've got to go watch people using the tool, go back and adapt, say, oh, we need this bit. I, you know, I need whole different modes of engagement for this tool. How, how does that process is that a thing that happens? And if it, it is, happens, no. How does that look? Sure. Um, how, how long does that take, actually, in practice? Yeah. Um, so as a couple of things here. So first, you beautifully kind of described um, where a lot of these very data-rich tools um, have been heading, or the way users are, are um, interacting with them. And that is, they're thinking often more in terms of having a conversation with the data. And so there are different sort of conversant styles, right? So like right. you were saying, sometimes initially people just want to go and see what's there. I just want to look at some data. What does my cube of seismic look like in this area, right? Um, and sometimes I'm going in to look at something very specific because we need to make a decision, right? Um, sometimes maybe, uh, you know, another conversant style is I'm, I'm going in to explain something, right? So maybe a decision has been made or we drilled and we didn't get what we expected. So now we need to do the rear view mirror analysis that says, well, why was that? I know something to be true and now I have to justify it with the data. Right? So there, and I, there's several, I, there's these kind of general conversion styles. And within that, the highest order, um, so in, in UI design, there's something called information architecture, um, which is uh, supporting users kind of just being able to move around this world that you've created, this experience, right? So if it's a monolith of a product like Petrel, whether you're moving between different kinds of tasks or modules or however you want to apps, however you want to think of them in that world, you have to be able to support the notion of these different conversant styles and what people want to do. And what we've been finding is it's, it, it is about, let's say, okay, now I'm doing seismic interpretation, now I'm doing basin modeling, because yes, they're, you know, they're, they're different points in the, the exploration or optimization process, right? Um, so people are gonna wanna do different things, but when you really start to percolate it up, um, it, it does still kind of come down to those sort of conversant styles and being able to support uh, people doing that. When you start talking about very large data, mm -hmm. right? Um, and visualizing it and, and interacting with it. Um, and then to your second point, um, there's uh, a lot of ethnographic research um, that is done and research can be an hour or research could be six months depending on <laughs> your project and appetite for it. Um, but there's no substitute for actually communing with your users. And I used to joke and say like mind numbing with your users. You are. Um, and really watching what they do and how they think about it and and 
people, especially in the case of software, often get fixated that their technology is at the center. No, if they're using Petrel, they're also, they probably also have three monitors and three spreadsheets open and, mm -hmm. and, and ArcGIS to your point and other viewers because maybe okay. Petrel can't pull up that legacy model and they need to co-visualize the legacy reservoir model with a, you know, whatever. And so there's the real world that people are living in to understand what we would call as the user's mental model of how they approach different, what you were describing, like use cases or tasks, right? And so you're constantly thinking about what should the experience be and what does the product need to do to support the business case, but then the user's case as well, and then their mental model of how they think about what they're trying to do, right? So a lot of moving parts. I don't know if that answers your question, but uh, a lot of moving parts to think about and lots of ways to kind of try to get at a solution. Can you can you use the interactions, the actual physical interactions of the user inside of a piece of technology to inform the future outcomes generated by that piece of technology? Uh, so to like, I just think about how that connects to outcomes. Um, so another stream, which I didn't mention, would be the analytics. Um, more and more software is starting to track um, applications. So websites have done this forever, right? You sneeze, a website knows about it. But software applications, particularly desktop apps, notoriously lack this user behavior data, right? And so that uh, that's a challenge. Um, as, as things move to being more web apps or in the cloud, um, there's lots of great tools that enable product managers to get in there and try to understand what the trends are and what people are doing and maybe using the software in ways we've never even imagined, right? Um, the, the key thing is that type of data is a place to start because it doesn't tell us why. It just tells us what's happening. It says these are the trends, these are the behaviors, but there's still some investigatory work that needs to happen to, to then interpret that, to understand, well, why is this trend happening? We never thought they'd use it this way. Oh, let's go talk to five people that represent that trend. Oh my gosh, all five of them are making it stand on its head like that. Well, there's a workflow here that we could enable to make it easier. So, you know. yeah, totally. no, that's a really good point. It's, it's amazing how uh, creative people are in a sort of adapting technology to their, oh, bending yeah. technology to their needs, right? Yep. Um, and yeah, we've, we've all, We've all done that. <laughs> I always often feel like any Microsoft engineer who, you know, a, a PowerPoint engineer who sat and watched a geologist using PowerPoint would probably <laughs> freak out completely. <laughs> I don't know. It would be, I'd like to witness that. Um, yeah, I did, the other thing I think is really interesting is this, um, the, I guess the things that make up complexity um you know because that some of them are i think easier to deal with, with than others or at least some of them have been dealt with better than others um like i, I don't think software's done a terrible job of adapting to the size of our projects um and not too bad at adapting to the sort of dimensionality of them, or at least the one kind of dimensionality, or maybe you could think of it more as richness. I think you used the, that word earlier, where it's like, I've got, you know, I've got maps, I've got seismic, I've got wells, I've got a lot of different kinds of data. But there is another aspect to the dimensionality that I think is not particularly well. Uh, and that's kind, of, that's kind of where the spatial, where you like, max out on your spatial dimensionality. So seismic data is actually, you know, more than three dimensions. It's like five or six dimensions yeah. um, that, that, you know, we are, we recorded or have access to. I've, no, I've not seen anyone do a great job of showing people those other dimensions, keeping them in the foreground. You tend to have to choose, oh, you're looking at this dimension now, you know, oh, now you're looking at offset. Oh, now you want to see frequency. Uh, like I'll show you one at a time. Um, and then the, the, the other kind that I think we've done a horrible job with is the uncertainty dimension. I mean, maybe that's another dimension or maybe it's a whole different aspect. Um, but the fuzziness, if you like, and the, the, the consequences of the dimension, of, sorry, of the uncertainty, I don't think we've, I've yet to see a tool or a visualization or a 
something that helps me get my head around or compute with that uncertainty. Um, yeah. Good sorry. Sorry. Yeah. 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 No, no, I... <laughs> I'm very good at this interview. Uh, business. We haven't done a podcast before, I promise. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you know, just need some training basically on like, interviewing people. My my interviewing style is basically state the obvious and then stop talking for a while. I'm so sorry. <laughs> no, no, this is great. I love it. It's it's, it's a dialogue. This is this is awesome. Um, I, I think about kind of piggybacking on that. I mean, that's that's really also. I I agree. I don't think we necessarily do a great job. Uh, software is, does a great job at that. But that's also an entree for again um, smarter algorithms or machine learning, right? To be able to aid uh, users with that uncertainty. So whether it's offering up some sort of a prediction on a metric, you know, if it's something that concrete, right, mm -hmm. that, that can be offered up. Sometimes uncertainty is the confluence of so many different factors. This mm -hmm. is too hard, right? It's, a human interaction problem mm -hmm. that I move through that. But at some level, like as we often talk about these sort of micro steps or micro, you know, uh, bursts of intelligence where we're not trying to like some huge revelation, we're just trying to offer a little bit of insight along the way. Um, we're finding yeah. machine learning can be really good for that. Yeah, I mean, I've, like with uncertainty in particular, I think, um, in a, you know, you could say, well, you know, the, the the logical arrangement of things is to sort of uh, qu like quantify the uncertainty in an understandable way because that's already a, like that's a massive kind of roadblock for most people because it's sort of pure statistics. Yeah. So it's all, all very well saying to people, "Oh, that's from a binomial distribution. It's a it's a you know a beta distribution. Or oh, that's Poisson noise." I'm like, I have no idea what these things mean. So so there's there's that as a barrier. And then there's computing with uncertainty, which is also tricky. And we might, you know, just use Monte Carlo simulation, or maybe there's clever things we can do with, um, you know, analytically. And then there's the visualization of it. And we, you know, okay, well, where does that, how fuzzy is my map now kind of thing. Mm. But I actually wonder if solving the last problem first would help people, would sort of motivate people to need to do the other things. So like, I, you know, just basically, okay, give me some totally Mickey Mouse way of representing uncertainty that we all know is fake or inadequate. And now just let me see it. And now let motiv that would motivate me to make it better. Yeah. It Gamify probably... it. Get the error bar smaller. Do yeah. yeah. But give me something to play with first. Like yeah. I need, I, like right now, I can't even visualize the uncertainty. So like, yeah. it's hard to think about. Yeah, it's so big and so thorny with so many different um, aspects to it, right? But, um, you know, as a product person, I think, you know, going back to the user and saying, well, what, what would be one little thing that might make you feel a little bit more comfortable? Mm -hmm. uh, or lower the risk just a little bit. It doesn't solve it. Doesn't solve uncertainty. It doesn't solve risk. But what could we offer you that would, you know, kind of take the edge off and, and give you a little bit of insight that maybe you know, gives you a little more clarity, right? And kind of start there and see what that feels like. And then well, what's the next thing? And what's the next thing? And maybe they add up. Maybe they don't. It could take mm -hmm. us down another rat hole of trust in there. But we'll, we'll, <laughs> we'll continue on that. <laughs> yeah, the notes that Graham had laid out. So we've already no, no, I, all this conversation is intended conversation. Yeah. No, I think we're actually going down the exact path I wanted to go down because I think that w we're talking about gamifying uncertainty, quantification, reduction of uncertainty, and that that dovetails directly into hmm. using information gained during interactions with a system to change something. Yes, and. You know, I mentioned before, potentially some of these modern technologies are eliminating users from certain pieces of the workflow. And you came back and said, well, actually, maybe those are the pieces of the workflow we don't want you <laughs> to be in, right? Um, focus on the, the interesting or complex stuff rather than the mundane. And I'm, I am actually day to day, Matt, driven 
to try to figure out how to like build patterns that are reproducible across disciplines or industries mm -hmm. in aggregating the, the feedback from the user so that we can, we can use that information to tune the system over and over and over again. I don't know that there is an answer to this yet. Uh, yeah. I mean, I think that you and I are actually on the experimenting. Are, a lot. Yeah. yeah, pushing and pushing and pushing on this. Um, have we come up with any insights on like how how to seamlessly aggregate or collect feedback from users about performance or usefulness or application? Well, so. I if, if the question is in general, like they're kind of old school ways of doing that, if it's through the interactions with machine learning. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't necessarily want to limit it to machine learning. I, I, I could because the same problem exists with whatever the backend technologies are. Like in a complex workflow, ignoring the actual workflow, there have to be common elements between all workflows for sort of um understanding how you in an in a in an online automated way like understanding how the user is appreciating or disbelieving or not trusting a system like this yeah i mean well the number one obvious indicator just to state the obvious is user adoption domain yeah. experts especially if we talk b2b will always have a workaround often your competition is not who you think it is your competition is excel and the algorithm that they wrote on their own that they think is better than whatever you put in your software, right? I mean, I, I, would, I worked for years in oil and gas and I'd sit in the trenches with users and they'd say, yeah, I, I don't trust their algorithm on this. So last weekend I just wrote, I'm just gonna roll with it. Very interesting, okay. So you are just gonna roll your own if we, if we have something that doesn't, you know, that, that you don't trust, right? Or, or doesn't, doesn't fit the way that, that you wanna work. I mean, the reason that this is important to me specifically is that now using, now to uh, circle back to machine learning is that because these new um, technologies exist, we can, we can use that feedback to make the system adapt to a user's workflow. Yeah, well, and, and, I, and that's a lot of the kind of experimentation work we've been doing. So from a, from a UX standpoint, um, you know, it's, really interesting um, yeah, challenge uh, to make it as natural as possible, right? So as natural as possible to um, kind of jump ahead here a little bit to enable that human in the loop um, to happen either implicitly or explicitly, right? So explicitly, maybe they take some overt action like this is not an anomaly, right? And here's why, um, or implicit action of they uh, institute a recommendation or they continuously ignore a certain type of recommendation, right? Mm -hmm. There's a lot we can learn from those things, but trying to make that interface, not, not just the UI, but I mean like interfacing with the technology and the, the person um, feel as natural as possible. That's also going to boost trust, right? In addition to the outcomes they're actually receiving or the recommendation or the prediction or whatever, yeah, over time. Um, and I think that's that's one of our challenges is to have it feel natural, um, not not outside of their mental model of how they would think about it. I think they're gonna have a funny conversation with somebody about it, right? Mm -hmm. Instead of a bot. If it was a conversational UI or um, those um, other explicit actions where we have the challenge of uh, we need certain kinds of data to inform the models. Right, and so that balancing act of uh, how do you get that enumerated data without it feeling unnatural to the user that they're, you know, going to want to game the system or not trust it or tell it what they think they should be telling it versus mm -hmm. what they really believe. Or, you know. so. Yeah, it's it's really interesting. Like I, I'm really torn about this sort of adapt adapting to users because on the one hand, um, like when I, th so they, these aren't really the same type of thing, but I think they're related. Like if you look at how um, Stack Overflow, for example, Stack Exchange in general, 
uh, works with user reputation, you have to essentially unlock achievements. So as you gain reputation, you get the right to um, edit questions, for example. You don't let beginners or, or newcomers to a community edit questions. You have to earn the right to do that by earning reputation. You can only do that by answering other people's questions, asking smart questions and using your votes smartly and stuff like that. So, so that's really cool because it means that by the time you let people do things like editing, which could be highly contentious, you know that they've been engaged in the community and should therefore understand a little bit about how it works. So I think that's really clever. Um, another one I really like is in Galaxy Zoo, which is a series of uh, citizen science experiments. Um, so for example, like one of the famous one is like the, um, the, the Galaxy Zoo is the original one. Um, so they've done other stuff with like seafloor photographs and stuff where they show people pictures of galaxies and get them to count this know how many arms they have in their spirals or what shape they are, if they're globular or disc shaped or what have you. And, and they keep track of how, of what people have seen and how well their answers sort of agree with people who they know are good at this. And as they get better at it, they unlock other types of problem mm -hmm. for them. So it's a very smart kind of normalization, if you like. Mm -hmm. I suppose that could turn into bias if you're not careful, but I quite like that. I think it's quite clever. So on the other hand, though, like Google Music, the app on my phone, seems to try to predict what to show me. Like, oh, I'm going to show you radio stations because, I don't know, they're promoted right now or you seem to listen to radio stations in the afternoon. Um, and I'm like, no, I'm just like, I get confused about the UI because it's changed from the last time I looked at it because they're trying to help me. So unless it's really awesome, it's annoying. <laughs> Because I know which thing I want. I went into the app for a reason and don't try and like get in my way with cleverness. So anyway, uh, it's, it's like if you're going to do it, you've got to be awesome at it. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> He's the canonical example. And that's one of the reasons that Amazon has done so well, right? I mean, I don't know about you all, but yeah. most of the time when they recommend yeah. something, I'm like, wow, I, I do need that thing huh. yes. how did they know i needed you know whatever yeah. um, and they're they're great at it and i've had other services where you know the recommendations just aren't aren't that that good yeah i suppose the classic terrible example or example of it not being done particularly well is the paperclip thing in uh, yeah. in microsoft right where it was it was often just completely annoying or, or whatever or badly timed But yeah, like I, I you know, and I, I don't know, it's really hard, right? Because what, what annoys one person might delight someone else. Um, if you can tell early enough whether the person's which camp they're in, then maybe you can, you know. In, in the, you know, as things get more sophisticated, being able to have degrees, I'm starting to see more options uh, with mm. things that are, are likely machine learning driven, right? Of like, um, you know, do you do you want to see recommendations or don't you? Or how? Um, like, so Google, really subtle one. I, I find useful. Other people may find annoying. But um, in Gmail, they've started doing this. Like, hey, did you want to reply to this thing five days ago? And it's subtle. But I can also throttle that down and say, never show me that, or only show me it after a week. Because sometimes I'm slow on my inbox, but I'll get to it. But after a week, I would like to know, or I only want to know that these people. Right? It's a subtle thing. Right? Yeah, it's right? it's so tricky though, because quite often with those things, I'm like unsure if I want to dismiss it because I don't want that to be interpreted as a. Do you know what I mean? Like I'm like, yeah. I'm never gonna see this again. Like yeah. because I quite like it. It's just not quite right right now. It's kind of like when um, pretty much like all of, like I don't know why I can't sort this out in my brain, but you know the intent. Like if you click on a Twitter link in an email and your phone goes. Do you want to open that in Twitter or in the browser? And it's like, um, what is it like this time or always? And I'm like, I don't know if I want to hit always because if I change my mind, how do I get this back? So I, I always hit this time. Trying to click on. Don't make me make an extra decision right now. <laughs> yeah, I feel like I want it to be like for now, but maybe ask me again in a month. Like, yeah. <laughs> well, I, and I think you know what you're 
describing here is the, the point of being able to have kind of some sphere of influence in which we operate in on um, these, you know, bits of intelligence and insight and options that come our way, right? Yeah. Whatever that is. Yeah, and maybe it is important to, to, to re-rectify those decisions at some meaningful cadence. Like maybe yeah. not, maybe time isn't the best one, but number of decisions or scope of decision or yeah. something. Yeah. And it's, it is, it's really subtle. The line between annoying paperclip and, and mm -hmm. getting it right can be subtle, right? Like it's these little things like, are you gonna ask me that every time? Or the difference between show me this only after seven days versus two days, right? It goes from, I'm, if it's a two day thing, I never wanna see this feature again. Oh yeah, if someone's been sitting there a week and actually percolate it up. That's sort of valuable to me, you know. That's why I, I haven't asked you to be on understandable radio in a year. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Hey, uh, we're running out of time, so I gotta ask you the question we ask all of our okay. guests. Are you ready? What are you reading right now? Oh, okay. I was like, is it is it? It's not a bad question. <laughs> um, so one of the things that I'm reading right now is a book called Stories That Stick. Um, and I thought I would pick this one of the variety of things that I'm wearing, reading, some of which are pretty geeky. And I, I figured this one may be one that, um, you know, a non-technical audience may not be um, privy to. Um, and she's a wonderful, um, she's got a big, the, the, the woman is Kendra Hall and she's got this great business market acumen, marketing acumen background among other things, and she's a speaker and author. Um, but um, what she talks about is, um, you know, there's a lot of marketing and messaging books out there, but she says, forget all that. Um, stories are what's paramount, right? So technology continues to be more sophisticated, and, and she talks about technology all the way down to products like gum in the book, right? <laughs> but all of it is about building bridges of communication, and she talks about different kinds of bridges of communication in the book um, that you want to build between different kinds of audiences, right? Um, and uh, different lengths, bridges, and depths, and like, you know, all that stuff. Um, but don't think of it as like a one-and-done kind of a message, or a, you know, a, it, it it's telling the story of why we need a better flow for seismic interpretation and something specific about it, right? Or telling the story of, of what the machine learning is doing, like how it makes somebody's life better or how it improves business or decisions or what, tell that story. Not, I mean, it's great. And we, we wanna hear about the finer points of the deep learning model. And, you know, we all get excited about the technology, but as technologists, you know, I think a lot of times we're so excited and admired in the technology that we don't take the time to put the periscope up and talk about those stories about what it is we're really building and why. Because the, the, the why is not we're building a deep learning model just because we're building, unless we're in R&D, maybe. Okay, mm -hmm. most of us, there, there's a bigger why out there as to why we're doing something. Um, and being able to tell that story as a technologist so that as a technologist, you can stay tethered to your work or tethered to the real users, tethered tether, tether the work to the real users and the real outcomes is super important. Anyway, so that, that's one of the books I'm reading and um, it's an easy read um, and she has a lot of great um, cases. Uh, uh, like I said, everything from technology to, to bubble gum and, and the stories that have been told to communicate to their user audience about um, a product or, or experience. Say the, name, say the name again, Stories That Stick. It's called Stories That Stick in uh, Kinder Hall. Kinder is, Hall. Uh, the author. Cool. Yeah. Matt, what are you reading? Uh, <laughs> I, <laughs> I'm reading, I'm sort of a little bit half-heartedly, I must admit, but I'm reading uh, Beginner's Icelandic. <laughs> oh. oh. <laughs> Appropriate. Since, since we're going to Iceland, <laughs> yeah, I thought, I'd, uh, I thought I'd see what Icelandic is like. Um, because I speak Norwegian, right? So um, I thought, well, how similar actually is it to Norwegian? It turns out it is somewhat similar. It, sort of more similar than I realized. Yeah, it's because it doesn't sound very similar at first kind of go. And it doesn't even look that similar either. But once you've got your head around the pronunciations and the spellings and things, it actually turns out that lots of the words are, are quite similar, especially to the dialect, the dialects that you get in Western Norway. So anyway, I, I highly doubt I will be 
conversant by the time by April by May, but uh, at least I'll get to practice a little bit. Well, I imagine Aquavit is universal, right? So you <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> cool. We'll see. We get to hear what you're reading, Greg. Uh, yep, it's the same thing that Matt and I talked about last week. I'm now finishing up the machine learning interpretability book by Christoph Molnar. Cool. And I must, last time we talked, I said that it, it was kind of um, not as interesting as I'd hoped because I was in the first half of the book where he was talking about model specific methods. So really diving deep into the weeds on each one of the little parameters. But now in the second half of the book, he discusses um, more generalized methods, like model agnostic methods. And um, I know a lot of, I'm not like a lay person, so I'm not maybe the correct audience for the book, but um, even still, and even not only knowing all the stuff that he's describing, but also having used many of the tools that he's describing, it's actually a really good overview and it kind of answers the question why for each one of the mm -hmm. different methods. So. I will upgrade my recommendation status slightly is okay. from last week. So, yeah, but only reason I can have it. <laughs> so recommended then? It is, it is recommended at a seven out of 10, six, okay. out, six something out of 10. To, something to at least, um, ha, you know, have, have a look at, uh, look for, maybe I'll look for it in the library. I mean, I think <laughs> what you could do is, probably just look at the table of contents on the website and then go jump into the tools. Yeah. Huh. Anyway. All right. Good to know. Oh, Let's hey, do a uh, show on that sometime. That'll be fun. Yeah, definitely. It's in the list. Um, I also wanted to mention, we always say, what are you reading? But I also wanted to mention that Lynn and I are writing a book too. Ah. And writing. Well, we awesome. write at the same time. At the same time. It's like <laughs> yeah. walking. Okay. What can you say about that? It's, it, uh, what's it about? You're the guest. <laughs> I don't know how much we want to say about it. How much do we want to say? No, no, don't. Yeah, please don't it has, uh, spill it any beans. With, uh, it has to do with uh, machine learning um, and the confluence of machine learning and data science and user experience and product thinking all coming together. See that? That's the, that's the first press release on that. Okay. That you heard it first. Great. You're on Understandable Radio. <laughs> Thanks for joining us, everyone. I'm going to stop recording now if I can figure out how. Okay.